And, um, and it's it's really a privilege to to be here. I I I hope I can apply and join this wonderful group after this. I I uh, only just recently found out about it, and 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 what a place to be. Uh, just yesterday, we launched the 1.5 degree lifestyles report, and um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit to it, and and also expand a bit on on, on some of the messages that I, I put out yesterday during the launch in in, in eight minutes. Um, as as we all know, lifestyles is a heavily overlooked area when we talk about climate change solutions. Partly for political reasons, but but also because it's a very difficult area to maneuver. And so, what we sort of set out to do was to actually bring the science to this in a way that it would help us understand exactly where the complexities are and where, if we start putting focus, then we would have impact. The approach we use here is uh, uh, consumption-based accounting as as opposed to territorial-based accounting, which is typically what the IPCC does. The advantage here is that it gets as close as possible to people's everyday choices and decisions. So we actually get bottom-up data from countries looking at food, housing, and mobility, and then extending it to services, leisure, and consumer goods. And as you would see, the difference here really is that uh, consumption-based accounting looks at also the ecological rock stack, the things I would consume in Germany, for example, that are, but that are produced in, in, in China. So what do we have? This is, these are the uh, 10 countries that we look at in the new report. And uh, that you can see in this case that um, the, the, by far the tallest, the tallest skyscraper on this chart is, is Canada. And, um, but uh, the UK, I'm sorry, that should be the UK, not Great Britain. It's not too far from that at 8.5 tons per person per year. What we've done here is then to take the remaining budget for CO2 emissions that would allow us to stay under 1.5, distributed it equitably across the globe, um, and then uh, try to understand what people's current lifestyle carbon footprints are, and to set targets for where they should be if we need to stay, uh, if we need to achieve that 1.5 target um, set in the Paris Agreement. As you can already see here, this, um, there's, there's a lot of disparity. Um, the, just for transportation in Canada, that already drives the entire uh, lifestyle carbon footprint of someone who lives in India or who lives in Indonesia. If you take the UK uh, transportation footprint, for example, that is roughly the equivalence of the entire footprint of someone who lives in Brazil. Now, how do this look? when you compare it to where the targets should be. That's, we have 2030 where we should be at 2.5 tons per person per year. And 2050 where we should ultimately be at 0 0.7 tons per person per year. The current global average is 4.6 tons. Looking at this carefully, these are the reductions that we're expecting anywhere uh, from 69% uh, uh, upwards for uh, highly industrialized countries by 2030. And if you look at it by 2050, that number, the number becomes even steeper, right? So we're talking about something extremely difficult here and we're inviting people into a space which is very complicated to navigate. But already you see the, the disparities there. You can also see the, the sort of uh, allusion to sort of historical contributions to global emissions and the, steep, uh, the steepness of the decline that is needed for some countries. So a planned transition, as we've seen with um, the, um, the corona uh, pandemic is going to save us a lot of pain in the future and is going to help us sort of protect ourselves against the chaos of an unplanned transition to sustainability. Um, just the, I'll give a quick example of one of the domains that we looked at. In this case, uh, uh, personal transportation. Uh, you, you see very clearly the role of motorized private uh, transport and, and, uh, and flying here. In, in, in the UK, for example, the impact of flying is quite disproportionate um, like compared to the volume. Uh, flying in the UK has about 29% demand, but it has about 44% impact in the overall uh, personal transport uh, category. Uh, you also see 
by look, if you look at the data, you would see a bit more clearly that countries like Japan that have developed very high networks of trains have much lower intensities compared to countries like Canada and the UK. In fact, while Japan has about 28% uh, demand for public transport, uh, the train network, uh, the UK has about 8%. But the message that usually gets lost when we talk about lifestyles is really that suddenly there's a, a finger pointing that only individuals should change because we're talking about lifestyles and household consumption. It is a much more complex picture. What I'm showing you right now on the screen is showing different layers of influence on individual choice. And the very center of it are the needs that we, we have, which we want to satisfy the need for affection, health, protection, identity. And as you move a little bit outwards, it's the personal situation that includes your gender, your income, your, your, your physical ability, your level of education, the friendships you have. And as you move even wider, the socio-technical conditions that frame production and consumption. This include uh, the, the infrastructure, culture, the politics of the country, the policies that are in place, and the, the, the messages from the media. It's very hard for individuals to have control over all of this. So our choices are subordinated to the context within which we find ourselves, the socio-technical context. This is really very important when we're putting out messages about sustainable lifestyles. And so what we need to do beyond just looking at individuals is first of all, make very clear that the role of individual choice is important, but also as important and significant is the role of policies and investments. So we have here three key areas that I call determinants of sustainable lifestyles. The first one is the right attitude, which is informed by the knowledge you have, the level of awareness, your social status, and so on. But just having the right attitude is not enough for action. You need to translate that attitude somewhere towards action. But if you do not have the right prices, if you do not have the right income to afford some of the more ecologically uh, sustainable uh, options, if the government does not have the right policies, it makes it very difficult. And last but not the least, if the infrastructure itself is not available and sustainable, that becomes even more difficult. So there are people who might want to ride a bicycle, for example, but if it, it is dangerous because lots of people are dying from bicycles or because there are no, no bicycle lanes in cities, then people just default to driving cars, right? Or if you wanna leave a source sustainable energy at home, but that is not provided for in your country, it becomes really very difficult. This is the complex picture in which we find ourselves. I know the numbers are daunting, but those numbers also indicate opportunities where if we focus food, mobility, and housing, especially, if we focus on these three, we are already, uh, we would already be addressing more than 65% uh, of the challenge. So thank you so much for this uh, uh, opportunity.